And so now, I hand over to our Reverend Sonia Davidson, our speaker this morning, who has prepared for you words that will inspire, touch, and lift, uplift us all. Please open your hearts and your ears to listen and understand. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I just want to thank Carol for just setting the stage for service. Isn't this been a most wonderful, calm, serene presence? And I thank her for it. And I know would like to welcome all of us who are here in the sanctuary and those who are on the World Wide Web. It's a lovely day, not as sunny as usual, pretty cool, complimenting the very cool nights that we have been having in our wonderful jam down. No, friends, I have put as the topic, the title of my talk, the greatest love of all. Something I have observed in my own life and in all the various permutations and combinations of relationships is that at the center of all successful relationships is a very strong sense of self. We can take it further, a love of self. And when two parties have that, it's even better. But for sure, if one has it, they can grow together. And when I say relationships, I'm talking about any encounter of human to human. What about when you're traveling on the road and up comes someone to wipe your, uninvited to wipe your windscreen. That's a relationship. And if we're feeling particularly good about ourselves, then the encounter does not have to be one of irritation. What about in school, when the teacher in frustration might say something that's a negative or a put down? A child who is growing up feeling good about themselves, just allows that to brush past them, no problem. So I start this morning with a quote that was shared on the internet by Pauline Wilson, one of our congregants. And it goes like this, it's anonymous. Everything changes when you begin to love yourself. You no longer send out energy of desperation and need. You become a powerful source within yourself that attracts better. It is equally true that people who have a strong sense of self-esteem seek to speak the truth of others, always. Truth comes from a consciousness of love and light. It is a recognition of the self, the self with a capital S, the one self that lies within each and every one, longing to reveal itself through human experience of feelings, reactions, and actions. It is seeking to connect with another for this longing is the individual soul intuitively seeking to experience God in the object of affection. So that is the direction of my thoughts and thinking this morning. My thoughts are on love. Love of self. All the things which we could say would make for which we could say would make for happiness, all the ways in which we relate to others is derived from an awareness 
of a love of self. The self being the power and presence of God, the spark of divinity, that which is beyond name, that which is the essence of everything we are and strive to be, the beloved, the Christ, known by many names, but the one. It is always the one. So to grow in our relationship with the presence, we must practice the presence. We must take time out to just be, to allow, To fall in, in love with the self requires time apart. Time apart from preoccupation with the various domains of life. It requires intention to just be, just be. To get to know the self, to allow it to reveal the self to itself as you, as me. to fall in love with the self. Remember the popular song, which has a line, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all? What if we rephrase it to state, learning to love the self is the greatest love of all? Frank Richelieu, one of our New Thought luminaries, in his book, The Art of Being Yourself, says it this way. We must learn to love ourselves. He says we must learn to love what we are doing. We must learn to love where we are in life. If we do, we will be carried to great heights of consciousness. He continues. The love to which I am referring cannot be forced. It cannot be manufactured or pretended. It is not sentimental. It is an outpouring of goodwill and reverence for life. It radiates to the heart of all people and all things. And in continuing, I want to share yet another perspective on the same sentiment. And this is from one of my favorite authors now, mystic, the mystic, Joel Goldsmith. He says, you are self-complete through God. You are not and never will be complete because of any effort you have ever made toward being good or being spiritual. Your completeness is in God. This is in accordance with the teaching of the master Jesus. And he gives us some quotes of Jesus to confirm what he has said. It, it goes like this. I can of myself do nothing. The other, the father that dwells in me, he does the works. The other, why callest me good? There is none good, but that is God. In other words, the power of Jesus, he continues, was really the power of the Christ made evident through Jesus. Remember that in, unquote, remember that in and of ourselves, we are nothing except that God be the reality of our beings. Christ is our true identity, and in, Christ, in the Christ, we are fulfilled in all completeness. We are complete because of what we are. God the infinite represented in us as the Christ. So let us pause for a moment, take a breath, and affirm, and I'll read it first. I see the beauty and worth of my true being. I am complete, I am enough. I'm gonna say it. I see the beauty and worth of my true being. 
I see the beauty and worth of my true being. I am complete. I am complete. I am enough. I am enough. Now, a question was posed about three years ago on the internet for general comment. And one particularly outstanding comment was shared by a Denny Moore who lived in London, Northeast. And it goes like this. Happiness is a mindset as well as a state of being. Only an individual can find happiness, and it is achieved by a person accepting oneself and one's life. I learned a long time ago that no other person can make me happy. I'm not going to waste my life on I'll be happy when, I'll be happy if I have this. Nah. I found that I am happy when I appreciate the simple things, the people in my life. Beautiful weather, ice cream, comfortable in my own skin. Once I learned these things and more, life became much more enjoyable. And I found I am happy now, right now. That is definitely a description of someone who is comfortable in their skin. Now, I had the opportunity, unplanned initially, and after planning, it was the way I chose to spend five days in retreat during the holidays. Personal retreat. Not retreating with a group, retreating by myself. And it was the first time I could recall in over 30 years that I have afforded myself that privilege. So it was during this retreat by myself in a very, not isolated place, a very, very quiet place in St. Anne, very near to where I grew up. No traffic was heard, only the sound of nature all the sounds of nature. And around me was the lushness and the greenness. And it was during that retreat that I sunk deeper and deeper into my inner world. The deeper I went, the more I appreciated the outer. I began to notice everything in a different way. Yes. I realized after a while when I looked through the window, there was this beautiful view of the sea, which I had to take two days before I even ventured to look out and see that I could see the sea at a distance. The birds, multiple of birds, were singing choruses in all kinds of voices, much more than the human range. The trees took on their own personalities. All sizes, shapes, vivid colors, shades, even movements I noticed were different and unique. Everything just seemed more beautiful in the deep, deep stillness. There was no need for conversation. I was at home with the stillness within myself. I was enjoying a profound relationship with the self. I was rediscovering myself and what good company I could be with myself. Not just because of my finite self, but because I took the time to commune with the Christ self in me. So I'm singing that song differently. Learning to love the self is the greatest love of all. Friends, I'm sure that all of us here have had similar experiences, not necessarily going aside by yourself physically, but there are times when we repeatedly go within to the silence. And I, I would hope and know that this is something that we would do on a regular basis. Wherever we are, the silence is always within us, so we can go there 
we don't necessarily have to physically go apart, although that was a wonderful experience for me. So much so, I forgot to tell you the best of all, I power walked with a 50-year-old man who is physically fit, uh, a farmer. I power walked for 11 miles from Prairie to St. Anne's Bay and came back, right? I came back in, I think we did it in, I don't want to lie, but I think it's about 45 minutes. We left at quarter past an hour and came back on the hour. That's 45 minutes, yeah, yeah. And it was like something was walking me. <laughs> I was walking. It was just absolutely rough. I haven't tried it since, but I will. <laughs> And I ran, I outran him, by the way. I outwalked him, by the way, this gentleman. No, to know the self with which we individually connect is this, that it's the same self that we are falling in love with ourselves. We know it's the same self in every other. And so the more we fall in love with ourselves and know, we don't even have to make an effort. That self where we are falling in love with that self, we are actually meeting every other self in that same consciousness. And so, things happen. Remember how we started? The radiance, the radiance. So there's a beautiful story that I was assured was factual. And I told that story in 2000, the year 2000. I couldn't believe that was 2000. That's 22 years ago, right? February, 22 years ago. And I thought that this is something I want to share again, because it really touched my heart. And if my voice breaks every now and again, you'll know why. It talks about a little girl who was sitting outside of a small church. This was in the USA. I think it was in Philadelphia, I'm not sure. And she was crying. And she had been turned away from going inside the church because she was told it was too crowded. But this lady, this little girl, when the pastor walked by and he saw her sobbing, he questioned her, why are you crying? She said, I can't go into the Sunday school because it is too full. So the pastor looked at her and he understood what was happening. She was shabby, she was unkempt, and he guessed the reason why she was not invited inside. But that little girl took no offense she believed that what she was told, that she could not go in because it was full. So, what did the pastor do? He took her hand and he found a place for her in the Sunday school class. The child was so happy that they had found room for her. So, she went to bed that night thinking of the children who had no place to worship Jesus. This was a church in Philadelphia. So some two years later, news got back that this child had died. Her parents called the kind-hearted pastor who had befriended their daughter to handle the final arrangements. As her body was being moved to be taken care of, a worn and crumpled red purse was found. It fell from her, which seemed to have been rummaged. It was so worn and tattered, it, it looked as if it was rummaged from a trash dump. Inside was found 57 cents. Remember, this was 1920 something, I didn't tell you that. And a note scribbled in childish handwriting which read, this is to help build a little church to make it bigger so more children can go to Sunday school. For two years she had saved for this offering of love. 
When the pastor tearfully read that note, he knew instantly what he would do. Carrying this note and the cracked red pocketbook to the pulpit, he told the story of the unselfish love and devotion. He challenged his deacons to get busy and raise enough money for a larger building. But the story does not end there. A newspaper learned of the story and published it. It was read by a wealthy Rialto who offered them a parcel of land worth many thousands. When told that the church could not pay so much, he offered to sell it to the little church for 57 cents. Church members made large donations. Checks came from far and wide. Within five years, the little girl's gift had increased to $250,000, a huge sum for that time near the turn of the century. Her unselfish love had paid large dividends. And we are told to verify this, that there, when you go to Philadelphia, you are to look up Temple Baptist Church, which has now has a seating capacity of 3,300. That was then, in 2000, when I read the story. And also to visit Temple University, where thousands of students are educated. He says, have a look too at the Good Samaritan Hospital and at a Sunday school building which houses hundreds of beautiful children, built so that no child in the area will ever need to be left outside during Sunday school time. In one of the rooms of this building may be seen the picture of the sweet face of the little girl who was 57 cents, so sacrificially saved, made such a remarkable history. Alongside of it is a portrait of her kind pastor, Dr. Russell H. Conwell, author of the book, Acres of Diamond. Come, hide my face. <laughs> OK. This story is rich with lessons. But the one which stands out for me in today's sharing is how this little ragged dressed girl saw her worth beyond her station in life. Her love of self allowed her to be comfortable in any company. And the effect of her caring created a multiplier effect which spread to benefit millions. She accepted what was said, that there was no space. She didn't take it personally. Couldn't be, because she had such a strong sense of who she was. How truly rich was this young girl's love of self? What a legacy. What a life. What a lesson. No matter what our circumstances in life may be, no matter what we may need to overcome, we are valuable and valued. We always have something important to contribute if we will let it happen. People who have learned to love the self are really unhappy because they don't take this appointment personally as some sort of irreconcilable flaw in themselves, but they take it as an experience to grow from. Happiness is a mindset as well as a state of being. Dr. Frank Richelieu again suggests that we prime ourselves to deal with the issues of life by affirming in this way. I choose to see the beauty of life. I allow this beauty to occupy my consciousness. Life is a wonderful opportunity for growth. I do not magnify pain or disappointment. I learn from them 
and move on to greater expressions of growth. It's a bit long, but I think it's worth our affirming, so I'm going to read it line by line. I choose to see the beauty of life. With see the beauty of life. I allow this beauty to occupy my consciousness. I allow this beauty to occupy my consciousness. Life is a wonderful opportunity for growth. Life is a wonderful opportunity for growth. I do not magnify pain or disappointment. I do not magnify pain or disappointment. I learn from them and learn from them and move on to greater expressions of growth and move on to greater expressions of growth. So friends, we will continue to take every opportunity to remind ourselves of the beauty of the Christ presence within us. So that as the master Jesus did, we may grow and wax strong in spirit full of wisdom and the grace of God, and in so doing, fulfill our true purpose for being. As an old Chinese proverbs, proverb says, if there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. If there is beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. If there is harmony in the house, there is order in the nation. If there is order in the nation, there is peace in the world. Let us do our part. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Sonia, for reminding us to grow in our relationship with that presence in us, which is the presence of love, and that learning to love the self is the greatest gift of